Mayor, we are ready to start. Thank you. Call the meeting to order. Uh, as we do not have a flag again, we will skip the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. Uh, clerk will note that all, all council members are present via Zoom. Uh, under ceremonies, announcements, and appointments, we do have a couple of announcements tonight. City Hall reopened on Monday following the governor's guidelines in the Idaho Rebounds Plan. We have implemented new safety protocols for the public and staff. We are encouraging our customers to do business online where possible by visiting the city's website in postfallsidaho.org slash online. The Post Falls Chamber is hosting a virtual town hall meeting via Zoom next Tuesday, May 12th at 12 p.m. City Administrator Shelley Underwood, Chief Pat Knight, and myself will be there to discuss COVID-19 and answer frequently asked questions. For more information, including how to attend the meeting, visit the Chamber's website at postfallschamber.com. Don't forget Mother's Day is this Sunday, and I want to wish Happy Mother's Day to my mom, my wife, and all the mothers out there. And also one last item, uh, I would just like to, from the city and from myself and council, extend uh, condolences to the Hauser family for the loss of Rich, who was a, a big part of our community for many, many years. So to Rich's wife, Pam, and the whole family, uh, please know that you're in our thoughts and our prayers. And with that, we do have a presentation tonight, Catherine Hoyer from the Panhandle Health District. Catherine, it's all yours. And it might actually be me, Mayor Joe Regello. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> take take it away. It and says Catherine Hoyer under your Catherine name. Hoyer. Under your it name. does, and 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 um, I went. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not intending to be misrepresenting, but. Uh, <laughs> Apparently that's the, the benefits of technology. And one more um, time, would you give your name just for the record, please? Sure, Joe Riello, Panhandle Health District. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. And um, so this afternoon I shared with the uh, Chief Knight um, some draft uh, language that uh, we recommended you folks use. It's uh, consistent with the same messaging that we sent to uh, food establishments. And um, uh, that includes all the food establishments in all of the five uh, North Idaho counties. The process is pretty straightforward. There's a um, three page form that's a fillable form. They can fill it in online or they can print it out and handwrite it. In either case, um, the food establishment would fill it out, uh, check the boxes that, um, that, that uh, they are going to um, work with um, those processes and procedures that are outlined in the governor's plan. And so they would go through and if they had any additional or different measures um, other than what was contained on the plan, then there's a space to write that. They sign it and then they um, are able to email it back to a discrete address that uh, we have on that on that um, recommended language that we provided to the chief today. And it, it, it would be the exact and identical site that we already have on our website and then we emailed out to everyone. So basically, they if they got it from um, the city of Post Falls, they would also have the identical information they got from Panhandle Health and is on our website. Um, and our understanding of the governor's guidance is all that is required of them is to fill out the plan, check the boxes that they're going to um, that they're going to use, or write in whatever language they want. If they've got additional procedures or something different that they're going to do, they sign it and they send it to us. That allows them to open um, when stage two uh, becomes available for restaurant dine-in, which is right now scheduled for the 16th of May. If for some reason there was something on that form that would cause us a concern, we would contact the restaurant um, or the food establishment and ask them, you know, some questions about it. But just to be clear, we are not going to, um, they're, they're, these are guidelines that are established by the governor's team. 
they are not necessarily items that are covered in the food code uh, and would be otherwise enforceable under the food code. So they're mostly guidelines and recommendations. For instance, there's nothing in the food code that talks about, you know, distancing um, of customers. That's an additional guideline that, that's put out by, by um, Idaho Rebounds. So that's pretty much the plan. Um, the governor's office has been pretty good about delivering um, information. We've already got all of that for stage two for uh, business or for restaurants um, on, on our website now and um, available. I would let everyone know that this afternoon um, we posted on our website because we received them from Idaho Rebounds and the governor's office, stage two protocols for other businesses um, opening in stage two. And uh, specifically that would include a separate uh, protocol sheet for close contact services. One of those ones that um, I know I've been waiting to hear about, barbershops, um, hair salons, nail salons, and cosmetic services. So that guidance is out today and it's on our website, as I said, as well as uh, on the governor's website. That uh, concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Thank you. Any questions of Joe? I'm seeing none. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate your time. Are there any amendments to the agenda tonight? There are none tonight, sir. Are there any declarations of conflict, ex parte contacts, and site visits? Lynn. I have one. Um, I drive by the 10th Street uh, project probably three times a week uh, in doing my duties uh, at our church. So um, I'll do whatever uh, council requests. Mr. Wilson, any issues with that? No, not, uh, not for just driving by on your way to and from your normal life. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. With that, uh, Shelley, would you present the consent calendar, please? Thank you, sir. Item A is minutes from the April 21st, 2020 City Council meeting. Item B is payables April 14th through April 27th, 2020. Item C is Green Meadows subdivision flat application. And item D is the police department equipment to be auctioned off list. Very short consent calendar tonight. Are there any questions? I'd move for approval of the consent calendar as presented. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Shannon, please take the roll. Anthony? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Borders? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Thorson? Aye. It passes. Thank you. We do have three public hearings tonight. And the first public hearing is the 10th Street Vacation. And I'm not sure who's taking the lead on that. Uh, there's Mr. Manley. All right, so can you guys all see the slideshow? I can. Yep. Yes. All right, so John Manley, planning manager here with the City of Post Falls, um, here to introduce the 10th Avenue vacation uh, case file VACA 1 2020 is the case file number. The owner applicant of this is Kenny Ross at 306 West Mullen Avenue, Post Falls, Idaho. The requested action is to review and approve the requested vacation for a portion of 10th Avenue, which was exhibit S1 within your staff report. You see this here. The location of the vacation uh, highlighted in the red hashed box is just west of Spokane Street and south of 10th Avenue. More specifically, you can see here in the exhibit that was part of the request, the proposed uh, future buildings. One of them is actually the foundation is in on the west parcel from my understanding. 
and the current situation is that it's less than five feet, just under five feet from the current property line. The vacation of that right of way would facilitate and allow these structures to be in conformance through uh, um, some processes within the city of Post Falls. Specifically, we would have to follow up this with some administrative permitting, but uh, it would allow uh, a conforming project in the future. Looking at the request, uh, staff has really no concerns with the proposed vacation. The one concern we did have is could we get sidewalk drainage and utilities? This can be facilitated through an easement rather than right away alone. And there we can attain the public benefits with the improvements as well as get development on the site. Agencies that were routed, you see here on the screen, we did receive no comments of the proposed vacation. That pretty much sums up the request. Do you have any questions for me at this point? Are there any questions of John? Al? I mean, why did, why did this uh, property or the foundation go in too close? Um, that may be, I believe the applicant's rep is um, available for those, that question alone. I do know that there was uh, some situations with uh, getting it constructed and there was an attempt to work with staff to get this in the correct location ultimately though under further review and not the most ideal time and place, this was discovered. And uh, so therefore both the staff and the applicant looked for a creative solution to mitigate this uh, occurrence. My other question would be that, are we going to vacate an equal piece of property on either side of this property? There's two adjacent home or properties. Yeah, that was discussed um, because we have the property to the east. They already have their frontage improved and I can go to that aerial. Here you already have some sidewalks here. At this location, staff kind of mold over should this go further to the west at this point in time. Being the fact that this is close to uh, Mullet Avenue and Celtics Way, Leaving that option open for future considerations probably may be in the best interest at this point in time, but we didn't see that vacating this would be detrimental to the downtown evolving in the future. Okay, thank you. I can't see uh, on my screen, Linda and Carrie, I can't see you uh, in the thumbnail. Are, are you okay? Do you have any questions? Joe does. I'm sorry, Linda, do you have a question? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Joe? Yes, I, I didn't had the same question as Alan, and then I didn't really get a response that I either understood or, or but my concern is, is if the foundation was poured uh, prior to or without knowledge of what the of what the property line, true property line is, then I don't want to set a precedence that hey, somebody can just go ahead and pour a foundation and we'll go ahead and give them uh, some right of way back. So I'd really like some more details on, on how this happened in the first place. Um, like I said, I think uh, I'd like maybe the applicant to explain maybe their side of how they got from point A to point B. I do know that there was an intent to meet code by the applicant. Um, did the share stop? Because yes, you guys still see that shared screen? Okay. I can't see the shared screen. Yeah, it went away on me as well. Okay, is it back? Yes, you can see it now. All right. Yeah, I don't know what happened. So apologize for that. But so once again, like I was stating is the applicant's intent was to meet city code. They were aware of the setback. Uh, 
in the field while they were pouring, they believed that they had gotten some confirmation that they were in the correct location. Um, ultimately, under some additional reviews to the permitting process, it was discovered that they encroached. There was no intent by the applicant to not meet code. It was an incidental occurrence through a misunderstanding, I believe, in the field. So staff got with the applicant to figure out a creative way to meet setbacks and still get the public improvements. Go ahead, Joe. So what exactly led them to believe that they were in the proper location? Did, did staff misdirect them somehow? Um, I believe there was some of a field visit um, by an explanation of a methodology to put the foundation in the correct location. I do believe there was a staff member that said that where they intended to do it by the methodology through a communication was going to work. Now, that being said, there may have been a misunderstanding on both parties or miscommunication to result to resolve this ultimate location. I see Bob Seals showed up. I don't know if Bob wants to add additional commentary on this as you were involved in this a little bit as well. You pretty much summed it up well enough. Um, there was communication uh, with the building department staff uh, and there was described as to where the property lines were to staff while they were on site. Staff <clears throat> did note, well, it sounds like you've done it correctly. Um, and <clears throat> turned out in the end, uh, after a uh, as built was performed um, or the survey was done on the property, was that it was not in the correct location. Um, this does, of course, lead to a bigger picture um, question as to whether or not the city should be requiring foundation as built uh, prior to um, framing. Um, and I think that that should be something that we take up in not too distant future. So uh, in lieu of this type of situation, but. Joe, go ahead. The typical allow foundations to go in before a survey is done. Typically foundations are not allowed to go in before surveys are done. Um, in this situation, the applicant indicated he knew where the four corners were. Um, and that a survey was going to be performed, um, but based on timelines, the survey was, a, um, I believe, a few weeks out. Uh, they felt the they felt the need to um, move the project forward as quickly as possible, and unfortunately, it backfired. Um, they provided us with the drawings as to where the foundation was going to be go, go was going to be going in relation to the supposed property lines, um, but the front property line uh, was not in the location where they had uh, thought it was based on it was they had based it on uh, another assumption uh, based on the neighboring property. <laughs> I believe. So I'm um, just in trying to mirror it up. So for the questions, comments. I can't, I can't see all council members. So if you do have something to say and I'm not calling on you, uh, please let me know. With that, uh, that would be the staff report. Does the applicant wish to speak? Yes, he does. Name for the record, please. Go ahead, Mr. MacArthur. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Uh, I believe uh, the owner, uh, builder, uh, Kenny Ross and his wife. Excuse me, Scott, would you give your name for the record, please? Sorry, Scott MacArthur, uh, H2, Surveying and Engineering. I'm gonna let the uh, owner builder uh, represent this case and I'll step in as needed. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Ross. Hello. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. My name is Kenny Ross. I uh, appreciate your guys' time on this matter. Um, to answer a question that uh, Joe had, um, typically building houses, um, you would have a 
building permit in hand in this particular case, we uh, were trying to uh, go forth. Oh, it's, I'm sorry, guys. I, I do not speak well publicly. Um, I, uh, what happened in this particular case was we got our, our foundation permit and um, we poured it, uh, we poured our footings. We had our footings inspected and the inspector asked me how I got the front of the building. Um, and there was, I told him how I got it and, and he seemed to think that that was okay and and he uh, approved us to pour the footings um it wasn't until the foundation walls were actually just about to be poured when we got our uh, survey back and that's pretty much right after we poured the walls is pretty much right when we ran into a problem with uh our foundation being too far forward we're having a um, we do accept responsibility for this. Um, this kind of work. We were under the impression that the inspector was uh, aware of your guys's right of way. Um, no. uh, we, in addition, will be providing um, easements for utilities, sidewalks, and et cetera. We just are trying to um, be in compliance with Post Falls city standards and um that's that's what i got any question of mr ross seeing none thank you sir thank you shannon is there anyone wishing to speak tonight we have none with that i will close the public hearing and i guess i officially didn't open it to start with so i apologize i don't have a gavel but I will close the public hearing. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Wilson. Warren, this was appear, appears to be an unintentional situation. And to go back to a comment, I think where uh, Mr. Malloy and Mr. Wolf were coming from, does this cause us any issues as we move forward um, by granting a vacation of a piece of right of way uh, to assist the homeowner? Thanks, Mayor. My, my answer would be that every situation that we have a hearing on needs to be weighed on its own facts. In this case, it sounds like we had an unfortunate misunderstanding of where the, the edge of right away was. I think you should weigh this application based on, is there a way for us to provide the necessary public infrastructure while giving them the relief that they're looking for? Honestly, what you're asking yourselves tonight is, What's the public interest? Is the public interest taken care of here? If it is, then I think you have a position where you can go ahead and vacate it. If there's no way for us to provide the public interest, then you probably shouldn't. And the, the fact that we have, we'll have uh, easements for the sidewalks, et cetera, that would uh, serve the public interest? I think that's up for the mayor and council to make that determination, okay. but that's, I think, the idea. Okay. Council, comments? Linda. I would just say that um, I, I think sometimes mistakes happen and it does appear that the sidewalks are going to go in. And um, I believe that it is in the best interest for just um, the city and the applicant to realize that um, the infrastructure will be there. It's an unfortunate mistake. And I think that um, given the fact that we're trying to um, do some possible different standards in the downtown area, that I think we may see more, more of this where uh, people are building closer to um, the property line. So that would be my comments. I would be in, in favor of the vacation. Thank you. Mr. Borders. We're getting the easements for the infrastructure improvements, but who's paying for the infrastructure improvements? I.e. the sidewalks, the swales. This is Bob Steele, just comment on that. Uh, the applicant would be the one that pays for the sidewalks and improvements. Okay, I, I'm fine with that. And, and I would support the vacation. Any other comments? Steve. 
So whether it's an easement or a right of way, we're still getting about the same amount of property from the owner for the sidewalks and the uh, improvements, or is it going to be a little bit smaller easement? Is the easement going to be smaller than the right of way, or is it the uh, same? Uh, John, if you want to pull up that map and just let us know, I think it's really similar. It's very close. Um, I believe that we're losing a little bit of it, um, a couple of feet maybe, um, but it provides the space that was needed for the uh, sidewalk and swale area. Okay, yeah, if it's only a, a couple, less than a couple of feet, I'm, I'm fine with that, so I would support that. John, you want to add anything? No, I have nothing to add. Okay, sounds good. Uh, can you see me, Mayor? I can't, Joe, but I know you had your hand up, so please go ahead. Uh, it's, it's a stupid question, but by giving up this right of way, are we essentially giving the the proponent an extra ten feet of property? Um. Yeah. In essence, yeah. By moving the right of way, the their their tax parcel will gain ten feet along the northern edge, but at the same point, point the usability of it would is still going to be the the public sidewalk and drainage swell and everything so the biggest issue here is if we ever want to expand 10th street wider or 10th avenue wider then we're now limited more by 10 feet on that side correct well do we still would have that easement we still have that the easement there that has for sidewalk swell and curb so with that I believe you could still do some public improvements within that that easement area. So, so what does the city potentially lose in the future? If we want to, if we wanted to, we didn't grant this. We wanted to expand the road as wide as we possibly could. Could we make it wider than we could if we do grant uh, this vacation? I think the limiting factor would be is if you widen the road, you would lose out on available space for your curb swell and sidewalk so it would make it difficult to attain maybe those type of benefits down the road so there would be a natural constriction between the sidewalk swell and curb and widening the road uh john as the planner do you ever anticipate that the road will need to be widened to the maximum width that is currently allowable without this vacation um off the cuff here i mean i don't believe that this small stretch would be long-term detrimental to the area. If it was a larger stretch, like let's just say we were looking at the parcel to the west around the those areas, I think that potentially would be more detriment, could be more detrimental. Rob Hollis may want to comment on that as I see he's available. Rob, any comment? Honorable Mayor, members of the council, Robert Hollis, Assistant City Engineer. According to our transportation master plan, 10th Avenue is not anticipated to need widening within the next 20 years. Um, it's speculating going out beyond that, but 10th Avenue basically dead ends with the elementary school on the far west end. And as traffic patterns increase, we don't see that the traffic volumes on 10th Avenue will ever be increasing to the point that would require anything more than its current two lane configuration or potentially a, a left turn pocket to get onto Spokane Street. However, we can accommodate that with the curb where it's going to be installed with this project, which is at the same location as the curb immediately to the east. Thank you, that helps a lot. Thank you. Um, oh. You know, I, I know that this is not ideal, but what's the alternative? Have the guy tear out the foundation? Yes. Okay. Any other comments? Council, how would you like to act? I would like to make a motion to approve file number VACA-001-2020. Second. Okay. Motion, second and a fine for Mr. Borders from Spawner. <laughs> uh, other questions? Shannon, please take the roll. Malloy? Aye. Wolf? 
Aye. Borders? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Anthony? Aye. The motion passes, thank you. Next item up under public hearings is the Tennessee Avenue vacation and I will open that public hearing. Can you guys see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yes, Tennessee Avenue Vacation, case file VACA 2, 2020. John Manley here, planning manager, here to introduce this project. The owner is Mort Construction. The applicant is Dobler Engineering. The requested action is to review and approve the requested vacation for the remaining easement that was once in Guy Road. So I know it's a little confusing because it says Tennessee Avenue vacation and we're referring to Guy Road, but hopefully through the presentation, this will make more sense. So what you see here in the highlighted area just north of West Range and east of Chase Road is an area of Guy Road or Guy Road at one time extended to all the way to West Grange over the railroad tracks. Since then, we have vacated that right away, but when we vacated it, we retained an easement because it was understood that a Vista needed that easement corridor to be preserved for their services. Upon platting, which this exhibit shows, the easement went through a lot that was platted, therefore constricting the buildability of this lot. That resulted in the applicant looking at the easement and approaching a VISTA to find out whether or not that easement was still needed. And they saw with the staff report that there was a release of interest in that easement from a VISTA, therefore making it eligible to be requested to be vacated. So. Even though it's a vac uh, vacation request, we also use that same process, which we normally use for streets for this easement. So the agencies that were routed in this request, as you've seen here, we didn't receive any other agency that was concerned with retaining um, this easement. We did have a comment from Kootenai County Fire and Rescue that they were neutral on this. That pretty much sums up the, the request in a nutshell there. Do you have any comments for me or questions? Any questions of John? And again, Linda, I don't see yourself or Mr. Malloy. So if you have anything to say, please let me know. Yes, Mayor, I do have a question. Go ahead, please. Um, John, I'm wondering uh, when you were talking about uh, we all do it the same way as we would do a street vacation, then is half of that property going to the property on the west and half of it going to the property on the east as would happen if we vacated a road? I think I would default. I don't know if it works the same way with an easement as it does a right-of-way. I think the, the vacation of the right-of-way is already um, preserved, but maybe Warren, if you want to comment on that. John, can you bring up the photo of the the lot or the the plat? This one here. Thank you. So, uh, I hear my quick answer is even for a street, the statute allows the council. Typically, it's one half to each side, and then it says, or is otherwise dictated by the council in the interest of justice. Essentially, here I think we would make if you wanted to vacate this, your motion saying that the entirety of the easement would be vacated in favor of, in favor of the lot that it crosses over. Did that answer your question, Linda? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any other questions of John at this point? Does the applicant wish to speak? Yes, he does. 
Go ahead, Mr. Name, Dobler. Name for the record, please. Go ahead, Mr. Dobler. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the council, Gordon Dobler, Dobler Engineering. Uh, just to add a few quick clarifications. The easement uh, as it was vacated or as it was retained in the original vacation is wholly contained on this lot. So uh, I think Warren has you know, astutely pointed it out. It would, vacation of the easement would go to uh, the lot that it's contained on, which is lot one. Um, just one last clarification is when we built the subdivision, a VISTA had facilities in that easement, but with the subdivision construction, they brought the service off of uh, Tennessee, which was constructed after Guy Road was built. So those facilities were relocated. What was there, what was in the easement area was abandoned, and there are no utilities in that easement area. Thank you, Mayor. Any questions, Mr. Dobler? Shannon, does anyone wish to testify? We have none. That I will close the public hearing. Council, it's up to you. Linda. I would um, I would be in favor of this uh, vacation. If no one has any comments, I'm ready to make a motion. I would move to approve file number VACA-0002-2020 in favor of the lot it crosses over lot one. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Wolf. Aye. Borders? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. And the third uh, public hearing we have tonight is an emergency ordinance to authorize administrative approval of subdivisions and hearing officers. And my understanding is this Mr. Cafferty presenting this? Actually, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. <laughs> okay. Bring up Open my the public video. hearing. Thank you. So, um, mayors, mayor, and council members, tonight we have before you an ordinance for consideration that makes some temporary changes to how we process hearing items in the city. Um, it does a couple of things. Let me bring those up for you really quickly. It, the first thing it does is that for 182 days, which is the time limit allowed for emergency ordinances, all subdivisions would be treated as minor subdivisions. It also would authorize for that same 182 day period the flexibility for us to use a hearing examiner in lieu of the city, or excuse me, the city planning commission to hold land use hearings. Other than that, the process would remain exactly the same with a, an appeal coming to the city council. For the subdivision process, all subdivisions would be approved as minor subdivisions. Currently, there's a break point with larger subdivisions going through a public hearing process where properties in the immediate 300 feet surrounding area is notified. For minor subdivisions, the abutting property owners are notified about the application. They're given a chance to comment on our standards, whether or not the application has appropriate roads, water and sewer, whether the lots meet the appropriate zoning requirements. Um, so that level of public input would still be allowed. Staff would review the the criteria make sure that we're meeting our criteria from there a decision would be issued and that decision could be appealed to the city council through the planning commission so ultimately if people wanted to get in front of this the planning commission of the city council they could do that and get a public hearing this would just give us the flexibility to frankly get some of the non-controversial subdivisions through the process faster. I, I would note that the state code does not require hearings on subdivisions. That's something that we require of ourselves. Um, following approval, the process would remain exactly as we do now. The, the application would come back to the council with an MDA, a construction improvement agreement, and ultimately signing off on the final approval of the plat. Moving on to the hearings examiner, uh, the state code allows for the use of a hearing examiner 
the hearing examiner can issue final decisions. You can use them for subdivisions, special use permits, variances, and rezone requests. Currently, our code contemplates this and says that we would pass a resolution to authorize the hearing examiners to do um, hearings. The one thing we don't have in our code that's a requirement of state code is the state code requires that our code say whether or not the hearings examiner will issue an advisory decision or whether it'll be a final decision. And so we decided to throw that into this emergency ordinance as well. The idea here being that I gather you're having a hard time hearing me. I, I hear you fine. All right. So. <laughs> I will tell the little elf to go away. <laughs> so the idea here is we're in the middle of, frankly, some shifting regulations and requirements for how we hold public hearings. We're obviously doing this by Zoom tonight. If we get into a scenario again where we're allowed to have in-person public hearings, but we have limited capacity, limited sizes that we're allowed to have in the room, trying to schedule a hearing in front of one person rather than a hearing in front of seven people may allow us to have in-person hearings more quickly. We don't know whether we will actually use a hearing examiner, but it allows us to have a little bit of flexibility in the hopes that we can maybe hold some in-person hearings at some point in the, in the near future. So the, the needs for, that we're looking at here, um, we have an obligation to provide timely answers to property owners who are looking to develop their property. At the same time, we have obligations to make sure that the public has a right to input. We're trying to make sure that we're accomplishing both of those items. Um, I already mentioned that hearings are not required on subdivisions. We would still have hearings on all of the other types of applications that we have. Um, with that, again, the changes are temporary. It's 182 days. After that, the code would revert to normal. And that's all I have for you. I'd happy to answer any questions you might have. Warren, I have a question you talked about uh being able to provide a timely a hearing. And if in fact we did go to a hearings examiner, are there enough available that we could do that on a timely basis uh, on a, in a quicker fashion than if we ran it through our normal channels? I think so. We've had a couple of people indicate an interest in, in providing that service for us. We've not explored that to date because we don't have the authorization, frankly, and we're hopeful that maybe we won't need to use a hearing examiner. This is really put in there in an abundance of caution to give us some flexibility. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Warren? I, I had one question. Go ahead. So Warren, I, and I asked this of John earlier today, is you said it would probably have no mm -hmm. impact on the budget, but how would we intend to fund this if we did use a hearing examiner? So we would pass that cost to the applicant. That okay. the applicant would pay for the cost of the hearing examiner as part of their application costs. Okay, so it's no cost to the city taxpayers to be the applicant picking it up. Honestly, there's probably some nominal savings to the city because the hearings examiner could write their own reasoned decision, which saves staff time in preparing that currently. It's, you know, it's not a ton of savings, but there is a nominal savings there as well. Linda. Um, Warren, I'm wondering, um, this isn't put under ordinance and resolutions on the um, agenda. I'm wondering if you're looking for an ordinance for this or or are you gonna bring that back at a later date? So we have the ordinance for you tonight for consideration. Um, our new <laughs> format of our, our um, agendas have changed a little bit so that typically we will bring back ordinances, but occasionally we intend to bring them under new business where they're timely or there's a need for timely consideration. And this was, we have this on the agenda as an action item for you tonight. Yeah, thank you. I saw that it was an action item. I just didn't realize that it was an ordinance because I I guess I'm a little confused about how it's written. Sure. Thank you. Karen? Yeah, I have a couple questions. So there would be no public input on these, whether it's a hearing examiner or administrative authorization? No, no there, would, there would be public input on both. If it's a hearing examiner, the hearing is still held as, as normal, except it's in front of a hearings examiner rather than the planning commission. In the case of subdivisions, 
um, notice is sent out to the adjoining property owners who then have the ability to comment. And I have another question. So in the memo, which was slightly different than what your presentation was, it said that dissatisfied parties could still potentially appeal decisions. Yes, yes that's correct. So they would appeal them to the planning and zoning? Sure. Our, our, and then our, to the, if they, if they were dissatisfied there, then to the, um, it has to come to the council. That's correct. So the first step would be under our administrative appeal procedures, they could appeal the decision from, from the staff, assuming this is a subdivision, from the staff, you could appeal that to the planning commission and from the planning commission, you could appeal it to city council. In the case of the hearings examiner, the appeal would come straight to the city council. Oh. So I know that this is good for 182 days, but if things straighten out in 90 days, will we go back to the planning commission? We certainly could. Okay. Yeah, the, the maximum allowed by statute is 182 days. If we're hope, hopefully back to complete normal before that, we can repeal this ordinance with one trip to the city council. Thank you. Lord. I just want to make sure I've got everything straight. So the way things are now, you've got minor subdivisions and major subdivisions. The difference being is a minor subdivision, you only have to contact the adjoining property mm -hmm. owners. A major subdivision, you have to contact everybody within, is it 300 feet? Is that correct? That's correct. So that would go away uh, under this emergency ordinance, correct? No. That's correct. So the, the difference would be instead of noticing the 300 foot radius, we're noticing the adjoining property owners. So oh, we'd still have a public hearing of sorts in front of one person instead of the uh, P and Z commission, but only a limited number of people are going to be notified of that hearing directly. That's correct. Uh, we're having a public hearing right now uh, in front of a body while maintaining all of the social distancing requirements and so forth. Why couldn't P and Z do the same and still maintain the code as written? They can. Uh I will tell you that we've not tried to yet do a large hearing. I have told that a couple of jurisdictions that have tried to have hearings where you had multiple people wanting to testify, that those hearings have taken upwards of four hours apiece. The concern that we have is that we have a fairly healthy backlog of hearings, that this would allow us to be able to get timely answers if we're trying to run all of them through our normal processes we're probably only going to be able to schedule one or two hearings per night, running two hearings per month, which is one more than we normally do. We're still looking at months trying to catch up to the number of applications we're seeing. So we, the concern is we want to make sure that we can provide the timely answer that we're obligated to provide. So I don't know how many, uh, what the bag log is and how much that consists of minor versus minor subdivisions versus major subdivisions. Can we, uh, the biggest part that bothers me is the lack of notice on the major subdivisions, uh, meaning that uh, we're not getting direct mail out to people within a 300 foot swath. And I think that's pretty important uh, in, you know, the, the, the surreal times we're all living in right now, there's been a whole lot of due process stripped away from people. And I think people are getting really frustrated about that. And we're trying to strip away some more from people who, may, who will be directly affected by these things. So that's the biggest concern I have is the lack of direct notification, whether it goes in front of a hearing examiner or P and Z. Uh, either way, I don't really, I don't have a, a huge feeling either way on that one. It's the, it's the lack of notification that bothers me. So can this be modified somehow saying that a major subdivision still needs to be notified within a 300 foot radius? So we could make that change. Um... I don't know that that's, we would have to make a change to the ordinance and bring it back because I'd have to figure out what that looks like, but that's something we could certainly change. Um, I would tell you that the training that we're receiving currently, and we've been hearing this for the last few years, is that that's, hearings on subdivisions are probably something that we shouldn't be doing anyways because they're kind of akin to a building permit. If you can meet the requirements of the code, you should be entitled to use your property as the code authorizes and so typically for subdivisions, you're looking at, do the roads meet our standards? Does the water system meet our standards? Does the uh, sewer system meet our standards? 
are the lots configured to meet our standards. If it meets those things, the training that we're currently getting is that you probably shouldn't hold a hearing. So even if we don't go forward with this tonight, this is probably something that we're gonna want to revisit down the road to try to make our process as, as streamlined as it can be and yet still providing an appropriate level of public input. I certainly appreciate that. And, and that is definitely something that's probably worthwhile looking at. The concern right now is the timing. And we're, sure. making the, we're making the change in the middle of a, of a state of emergency where there's all kinds of, of pretty intrusive changes happening. Um, so that would, uh, that could be viewed upon poorly by the, by the public. Uh, the other question I have too, is if we were to allow a, an examiner for minor subdivisions only and leave the major subdivisions with the current process, is that another option? Would that actually save any time? Probably not because currently the staff is reviewing the minor subdivisions. So that doesn't change a whole lot. The, the hearings examiner, assuming that this pass tonight would probably be limited to special use permits, zone changes. Those are the two that they would probably see. The subdivision would go through this through the staff as well with an appeal to the planning commission. My final thought on this too is that, um, you know, if, if we do approve this, I would like to see a, a clause rather than, you know, the, the limiting at the maximum 182 days or whatever it is to that or until the state of emergency is ended, whichever comes first. We could do that as well. Steve. We would still go into the notification, still have to publish it in the press under legals that the city of Post Falls is hearing, having, a, having a, the meeting with the hearing examiner. For hearing, some, yes, that's correct. For anything that's going to the hearings examiner, it would be noticed exactly the same as we're currently doing. The only difference would be at the hearing examiner hearing the, the item and not the planning commission. Okay, so it'd still be published. So there'd still be public notice of it. In that fashion, for for the subdivisions who that are gonna go through the administrative process, that would not be true. Okay. Jerry, do you have a question? Yeah, so if if it's noticed that it's going to the hearing examiner, there's still no public comment? Anything that goes to the, to the hearings examiner is exactly the same. There's an opportunity to testify, to rebut evidence, everything that we normally do. Think of it as trying it to a judge rather than so the hearings examiner is essentially acting as a judge. Everything else is the same. Well, I know that I know that there's a lot of unknown right now and no one has a crystal ball. But at our last meeting, uh, when I had inquired about the state of emergency, uh, the thought was that this is going to go through the year. You know, go through uh, the end of the year, 2020. So 182 days is six months. So likely it will go the full 182 days because I don't see the state of emergency uh, ending before that time. But if you went either or you'd have that option and then at the end of that 182 days we'd have to decide what action to take at that point. Yeah. Linda. If we don't have any more comments, I would make a motion. Well, we still have testimony. Oh. This was staff report and questions. Oh, I see. Sorry. So, uh, no more questions warned at this point. Shannon, anyone wishing to testify? We have one. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Does the applicant, that would be us, correct? That's us. Okay, so now we're down at the uh, anyone wishing to testify. We have one in opposition. Okay, and please uh, state your name for the record. You've got four minutes. Shannon will notify you when three minutes is up. And then at the end of that time, uh, testimony will be over. Name for the record, please. The well, name is uh, William Scott Howard. And uh, Mr. Mayor and Honorable Councilman, just making sure you guys can hear me here. We can. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak on this today here. As I was going through the agenda on uh, that was posted on the website here, the copy of the ordinance attached therein, uh, I wanted to point out that the majority of the uh, reasoning for this being an emergency ordinance are have been either removed, proven false, nullified, 
or not applicable in our situation, um, including the uh, March 25th order by Governor Brad Little, uh, the stay at home order, which was rescinded. Uh, that order can be found at the uh, governor's COVID-19 website that has shown that that order has been rescinded. Um, the new stay healthy ordinance or order by the governor states that business and government agencies may resume operations at physical locations in the state of Idaho. Uh, so that being said there, the need for uh, this ordinance here um, does not meet the needs of it being an emergency ordinance. To follow up here, looking through the ordinance or the, the ordinance as it's written and published for public review, it does remove all notification requirements as it is posted on the agenda. Uh, it removes the requirement to post a notice in the public paper. It removes the notice for property owners within 300 feet. It removes the uh, property notice required on the property. It removes the notice and request for comment to be mailed to agencies, utilities, and other jurisdictions deemed uh, appropriate. It removes uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission from every aspect of this, including the appeal process, uh, as it is written, stricken through on the record. Uh, I would encourage the City Council to deny this emergency request as there is while we are currently in a state of emergency for the state, uh, requiring this ordinance to change the city code, remove the public input and uh, bypass current processes does not seem the right thing to do at this time. Um, and as it is written here, the removal of all such notices uh, with addition to the, the aforementioned uh, revoked or rescinded ordinances I, I highly encourage you all to vote no on this emergency ordinance. If you want to come back with an ordinance that modifies this in some other matter that does not require such an emergency state uh, to go in and, and, and further minute. reduce the public's ability to be present and, and, and testify on these matters, I highly encourage you to do that if, if you so need to. But council, I do ask you to deny this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wilson, would you care to respond? There are a couple quick comments. Um, Mr. Howard's correct that the ordinance does show that all of the normal notification procedures are stricken because those are the, the requirements for how we would handle a, a hearing on a subdivision, not how we would handle an administrative review of a subdivision. The things that you don't see in the code because we only show those provisions of the code that are being amended or all of the appeal language that lives elsewhere in our code. So you still have the right from an administrative process to appeal it to the planning commission and ultimately to the city council. Um, as far as um, whether or not there's an emergency exists, we're still under a stay safe order. It has the same restrictions on public gatherings as it did at the stay home order. Um, we hope that that change in the near future, but we don't know exactly what's gonna happen. We're hearing guesses that this is probably going to come in waves and we're going to see some loosening up of restrictions then some tightening up of restrictions and so really this is aimed at trying to provide enough flexibility that we can provide everybody's due process the due process of the citizens but also the due process of folks who are looking to develop their property in a timely manner thank you any questions warren shannon that was the only uh person wishing to speak is that correct that is correct. I will then close the public hearing. Council, how would you like to act? Well, I would uh, make a motion. I would move to place the ordinance, emergency ordinance to authorize administrative approval of subdivisions and hearing officers to include no more than 180 days max or until the state of emergency is lifted. And on its first and only reading while under suspension of the rules. Second. Second. 
Uh, motion second, I have a question. Linda, you said 180 days, I believe it's 182. Is that correct, Mr. Wilson? That's correct. 182, excuse Thank me. You. Thank you. Is that okay with the second? Yes. Further discussion? Mr. Malloy. I still think there's there's ways to speed the process while still providing all of the, uh, certainly the notifications to the public, uh, public hearing. I understand that there are technical difficulties with Zoom meetings. We've obviously our first one was a perfect example of that. But if a, if a meeting that was would normally take an hour takes four hours, but it maintains everybody's right to a hearing, I think that's fine. We all gotta make sacrifices for this and we don't need to sacrifice you know, the public's input. It seems a little bit backwards to me to allow things to go through and get passed and then the public has to try to get it undone to be heard. Uh, so I would be opposed to this. Linda? After Joe's statement, I think I'm going to withdraw my motion. Mr. Wilson, uh, the, the uh, Mr. Malloy expressed concern. I know Councillor Thorson has expressed concern that this would eliminate public's right to input. Is that correct? So the, the public input, if the subdivision is heard through the staff, currently as it's drafted, it is Notice is sent to the adjoining property owners. If we want to include that to notice to all of the folks within 300 feet, we can do that. That would be something that we can do. Or we can, honestly, this is something for your consideration. We'll, we will follow your lead. Mr. Anthony. I would feel more comfortable if we went and we could do all the notices because I still think the public, the way it was explained to me, if we do all the notices with the hearing examiner, the public can still come to city hall. So many people could be in the council chambers to give testimony and the other people would wait out in the uh, lobby and then be able to come in and testify once we met that number of people. But I think the biggest concern is the notices of the public that were, that there, we have a hearing examiner holding that, that meeting. So I'm kind of with Joe there. If we can do the notices, I, I would be in favor of this ordinance to let the public know. Jerry. Yeah, it's not just a noticing, it is the ability for the public uh, beyond just writing to have input and and testify. They are allowed that. We've is that correct, Mr. Wilson? So anything that's going in front of the hearing examiner, everyone gets notice, everyone can testify. Everyone can testify the ones that you can't is if it's if the subdivision is heard through the administrative process that we're currently using just for minor subdivisions and that in that case it's just in writing mr wolf i guess i'm going to take the other side of this issue because the thing that concerns me or bothers me is when the public does come in and testifies on a public hearing and they really don't have any rights if the, if the applicant has checked all the boxes and crossed all the T's, it's frustrating for the public to come in and say, well, I don't like this or it shouldn't be done. And it's like, it's already a done deal. They've already done everything that they need to do. So I understand where everybody's coming from as far as public input, but if the public input can't be considered, what's the point? Linda? So I guess, um, Councillor Wolf, if I'm understanding you correctly, are you saying that if the applicant meets all of the criteria for the subdivision to be approved, the council has no reason to turn it down, which I totally agree with. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, we've seen it before where people have come before even planning and zoning and we've had to back out of it because uh, we can't really do that. So again, I think Warren, you can clarify this for me, but if all those things are in order, it's kind of a moot point. That's why it, we're not technically required to hear subdivisions. Is that correct? So you're kind of hitting the nail on the head and that's under state law, we're only allowed to consider certain items for each of our, our um, public hearing items. For subdivisions, really, you're focused in on 
and lots meet the requirements of the zoning code. Their utility is in as a proper street network. Um, if they meet the approval criteria, that's all we can consider. If someone doesn't like um, uh, its impact on their property or they don't like something else, a lack of open space, whatever it happens to be, if they don't like that, it's not something that the city can consider in determining whether or not to approve the application. I think that's why we're starting to see in our training at a statewide level, a push for us to start moving away from public hearings on subdivisions, because it does exactly what you're saying. It, it invites the public in, asks for their comment, and then infuriates them because their comments don't really get them where they hope it would get them. That's my point exactly. So the public's input would come in the, more at the zoning, annexation and or zoning uh, phase of this, is that correct? That's correct. Joe. I appreciate everything that's just been said, but I don't think we need a state of emergency or an emergency ordinance to make changes. So I still think this is the wrong way to do that. Linda? Um, well, I'm, I'm just, I just wanna be clear that this is only for subdivisions it's not for annexations and it's not for zone changes. Is that correct? So for annexations, that's always a city council item that would come to you. For zone changes, there's the potential that we could take a zone change through the hearing examiner, but it would never be determined by staff. It's either gonna be a recommendation from the hearings examiner or the planning commission. That recommendation comes to the city council who makes the ultimate determination. Linda. Well, just kind of um, along that same lines, I think that more than people um, uh, objecting to subdivisions in the past couple of years, they have been um, objecting to annexations. So um, I, I, I feel like I understand the subdivision ordinance. I understand what we're doing here to be right along the lines as, um, Councillor Wolf was saying, because I agree with that, uh, but I would not like to see annexations go uh, before a hearing examiner during this COVID-19 pandemic. I, I, think, I think that if we have annexation um, requests, that we should do our best to have a public hearing via Zoom or however we can do it um, to, to adhere to the, the distancing that we are supposed to be doing as far as the, uh, uh, as far as the subdivision goes, I will reinstate my uh, first motion. So I know it's getting kind of confusing. Would you like me to- Please restate uh, it. Excuse me? Would you please restate your motion? Okay, I would move to place the ordinance, emergency ordinance to authorize administrative approval of subdivisions and hearing officers not to uh, up for up to 180 days or until the state of emergency is lifted, not to include annexation hearings. I would second that if you make it 182. I think I'm saying 182, but maybe I'm not speaking very well. 182. Uh, okay. So we have a motion second, Mr. Wilson. Did you not say a few minutes ago annexations have to go through the P and Z or up to council? Yes, those that we're never going to run the annexations through um, an administrative process. Those have to come to the council. So, so that's not part. That's not part of this change. They will continue to be handled as they are. Thank you. We have a motion second. Further discussion. Jam, would you please take the roll? Borders? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Thorson? Nay. Anthony? Aye. Malloy? Nay. Wolf? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Next item up on the agenda is unfinished. Uh, excuse me, Mayor. I yes. think that um, Mr. Wolf needs there. to read the ordinance. <clears throat> You know, I got so, so caught up in the changes, I forgot. Thank you very much. Sorry. You're right. Mr. Wilson. Okay, an, an emergency ordinance temporarily amending the municipal code of the city of Post Falls, Kootenai County, Idaho for one, 182 days or until the emergency notification is re rescinded 
amending section 117.12060 to allow all subdivisions to be processed as a minor subdivision without the necessity of a public hearing. Amending section 1820.060 to authorize the use of a hearing examiner with some final land use decisions, suspending conflicting ordinances during the term of this emergency ordinance, providing severability, providing for the publication of this ordinance by summary and providing an effective date. Move to approve the emergency ordinance authorize administrative approval of subdivisions and hearing officers for up to 182 days or until the state of emergency is canceled to ask the clerk to assign the appropriate number and that it be published by summary only. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Thorson? Nay. Anthony? Aye. Malloy? Nay. Wolf? Aye. Borders? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thanks for catching me on that, Linda. <clears throat> Next item up on the agenda is unfinished uh, business. And tonight we have none, followed by new business. And we have a couple items. The first is clarifying water and sewer capacity fees and repealing subsequent user fees draft ordinance. Mm -hmm. There's Mr. Cafferty. Sorry, I had a little technical difficulty there. I apologize, my computer kicked me out and I had to go on my other computer, which didn't have audio and video, and I have to turn off that one and come back. So, basically, what this is, is the city currently has in place a subsequent user fee ordinance which was adopted a number of years ago. Let's see if I can turn my camera a little bit better. Um, it affords the city the opportunity to allow developers to put in infrastructure when the city's not in a place to do that. This ordinance has been in place for a number of years. Um, and like many of the jurisdictions around the state was put in place, but hasn't really been utilized very much. In the interim, since this was adopted, the city has also come up with other fees to make itself whole that has the potential for the two ordinances to clash. And so because the current tools the city has fit better for the city's needs, needs excuse me, than the subsequent user fees, it's my suggestion that the city repeal subsequent user fees as an ordinance and a remove that possibility from consideration for applicants. And the reason I suggest that is, I think there's, again, like I stated, the potential for conflicts. Additionally, I think it puts applicants in the mindset that this is a possibility when it's very rarely, if ever, a good possibility. And so I think it's unfair to leave that out there for them to try to reach for that golden ring that really isn't necessarily attainable. So kind of a house cleaning and kind of a risk management idea was the premise behind the request that you repeal this current ordinance. John, I have a question for you. Yes, Mr. Mayor. So you've got subsequent user fee and I may be way off base, but I've, I've kind of liked that premise. So if you have someone looking to develop and they're putting in X number of feet of sewer that's going to serve their property, and then you've got other subsequent users who come in and occupy the space, uh, you know, that they have crossed. So now they have access to the sewer. Does that then mean that they don't have to cover any of that infrastructure cost other than the cat fee? Yes, that's exactly what it means. And I can state from what I've seen over the years, they usually are good for up to five years. And so the neighboring properties wait five years before they develop. So, the intent of making the developer who put in the infrastructure whole is not often if ever realized and more likely than not, it stalls development in an orderly progression from the surrounding properties because they know they can wait it out. And additionally, it puts the city in the position of collecting fees for a third party, kind of like 
the concern Mr. Malloy had in an earlier hearing this evening about the city giving away property. This is the city acting as the collection agent for a third party by withholding permits and the like. In addition, it puts, it calls into question the other fees that the city collects to the point where it's within the realm of possibilities that you could have to forego certain fees in order to administer this current fee for the developers. That, I guess, I guess my, my concern would be, you're right, maybe it's seldom used and maybe the inter, uh, people who would occupy the interim or in-between property uh, can wait the developer out. By the same token, you could have someone that wanted to be a user of that property and if they know that the folks on the outside are going to be putting uh, on the extremity are going to be putting in the infrastructure, they could just wait till they put it in and come in, you know, next year. Uh, I just like, I guess I like to see people pay their own way is what I'm saying. And so by allowing this to go forward, you, the city is potentially paying their way because it's likely that you would have to forego some of your fees in order for the developer to collect this fee. Linda? Yes, Mayor, thank you. I believe that we just ran into this situation um, not even a year ago, and I would um, wholeheartedly agree with the mayor. I feel like people should pay their own way if it's possible for them to do it. So, um, and I can't remember the piece of property that we were talking about, but I do remember that it was, um, I think it was, uh, I think we talked about it for a long time. I think it was debated for a long time. And I do believe that we did grant um, a subsequent user fee to someone, but I can't, it's been a long time ago. I can't remember who that was. Yeah. John, if, if we eliminate this ordinance, do we still have an ability, should the need arise to come in and address this uh, on a case by case basis? The ordinance, well, a, a couple of ways to look at that. The ordinance would be repealed if you repealed it. Mm -hmm. The council always has the opportunity to reinitiate an ordinance that may more accurately address the current legal environment. Mm -hmm. Additionally, as it often happens, you have the opportunity to site specific, you know, A, you have your impact fees, which you probably didn't have at the time this was passed. You also have your other connection fees that weren't in place when this came to light. And you can have the opportunity to make people whole through the development agreements that you enter into when they annex or in other processes. So you have other avenues available to you to make sure that people pay their fair share to get things done. Another, I mean, you can, LIDs are still a possibility, I suppose, to bring infrastructure in so that the other property owners who are reaping the benefit get to pay for that and some other options. This wouldn't, if you repeal this ordinance, it doesn't completely tie the city's hands. It stops the city from being the uh, enforcement mechanism between two separate parties. That's the biggest issue that it takes you out of. Because as it's drafted right now, if a party refuses to pay the subsequent user fees, the city withholds the city's other permits, even though the city's fees have been paid. As you can imagine, that's somewhat problematic. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts on that? Mr. Wilson. A, quick, a couple quick thoughts. Um, John is correct that, that these types of arrangements, while we have done them in the past, we've not really seen anybody collect because people end up waiting it out. Since this ordinance was adopted years ago, there's in the last few years has been some case law that's come out that causes me and John, frankly, both some doubts about whether or not this is a viable solution. If it were to be challenged, as John mentioned, it makes us the collection agent for a third party, which is never a comfortable position when the government comes to you and says, hey, you've paid all the fees that the government requires, but unless you pay this other guy, we're not going to let you develop your property. That can become fairly problematic. I can also tell you from personal experience and in a prior life at a different city, I administered one of these agreements for 10 years. It puts the onus squarely on staff. If things get missed, you're creating liability every time you miss something. And that liability is for the city. 
they are very problematic to enforce. They're problematic to deal with. The concept is great. It's just when you get down into the weeds and trying to actually use one of these, it's not a terribly easy thing to do. Well, again, as long as we have an opportunity uh, to have people pay their fair share, I, I will be okay with it. I just want to make sure that we're not giving somebody an, uh, an easy ride on the coattail of someone else. What other comments or thoughts? So we do need a motion on that. I would, is it just a motion to, if the council wanted to go forward, just a motion to remove the ordinance, would that be the motion? Um, this would be the ordinance. It's gonna come back at a subsequent meeting is my understanding. Okay. Okay. At this That's point. True. This is one of those things that we were trying to do to confuse you. And like I said, most times we will bring the ordinances okay. back. This is one of those. It wasn't one that the time was pressing on. So the motion would be to direct staff to bring it back? That's correct. Okay. Council, anyone want to float a motion? I'll make a motion to direct staff to bring it back. I'll second. Motion second. Further discussion? Shannon, would you please take the roll? Anthony? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wolf? Borders? Aye. Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Motion passes, thank you. Aye, you're a little bit hard to hear. I don't know if it's you're just too far away or not, but you're a little bit hard to hear. I'm actually having trouble hearing Shannon when she's calling the roll. Okay. We'll all speak up. Um, <laughs> Next item under new business is contract for Hilda Keller parking lot construction. Robbie, I think was going to present that. All right. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes. sir. Okay. Um, good evening, mayor, members of council, Robbie Quinn, parks planner here. Um, and I'm gonna switch over to my presentation real quick. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes, sir. All righty. Um, so I'm here to present the Hildy Kellogg contracts for the parking lot construction. Um, so a little bit of background, uh, the Hildy Kellogg Park is located on the corner of 21st Avenue and Idaho Street. It's roughly a four and a half acre park, primarily used for soccer. As you can kind of see a, a full size soccer field pretty much takes up the entire grass area on this park. Um, and then there's kind of some native pines stands in in various areas around the soccer in um, our current park and rec master plan a uh, parking lot improvement in addition of a permanent restroom were medium priority items so those are essentially what we're tackling with these contracts so previously we've been under contract with jeb engineers for the engineering and design for this parking lot. And there was, when, when this was presented last fall, um, the, one of the reasons was because JB was also under contract with the water division to uh, develop the well house improvements, which right here is the existing well house. And so, like I mentioned, we've been in coordination with the water division. Um, they are currently under construction on their well house improvements. And so generally the well house uh, is gonna be a larger footprint by almost double. So the fenced area will extend somewhere in this air, this region and the building itself is also almost doubling in size. And so with that, we ended up wanting to relocate the playground. And in our discussions with the water division, they also mentioned it would be important for them if we could help provide some sort of screening in shade with planting material to protect their building. Um, 
And so the reason we're coming to you now is again, because they are currently under construction. This is actually a photo taken today. You can see that the building has been removed and they're in the process of uh, rebuilding their site there. And so we wanna go in with them from a timeline perspective, not necessarily from a contract perspective, but to be able to reduce the construction impact to the park and the park users um, by, by being able to make these improvements by the year's end. And so the well house timeline is scheduled sometime finished towards the, the fall of this year and our uh, parking lot improvements would likely um, be complete towards the end of the summer. And so just to go over the proposed design a little bit with you, um, some of the parking lot considerations we had to make were for a potential crane for the future maintenance of the site. And so if you can see some of these islands that are typically planted, in this case, they'll actually be asphalt. So it'll allow a, a crane to come in here, park, do their maintenance, back out, and then leave the site. Um, we were also increasing parking capacity by nearly 50%. So the existing gravel used to be right around here and we're adding an additional 10, 10 or so spaces. And lastly, we had to look at um, upgrading the site to meet the current city design standards, which would include the, the curbing, the pavement and surrounding landscape uh, shade requirements. And so a couple other park related improvements, like I mentioned, we're, we're relocating the playground. So currently it sits about in this area and we would propose to move it up north closer to the existing shel picnic shelters and the new proposed restroom. We would be providing ADA improvements to the site with access to the parking lot, um, the newly installed sidewalk on 21st Avenue and to the playground and the existing shelters. And we would also be installing the restroom, as I mentioned. And lastly, a general improvement in the landscaping around the parking lot, um, more specifically, like I mentioned, to help screen and protect the well house. So there's a grouping of an existing pines in this area. And so when these trees mature, essentially this will be in the shade for the majority of the day. Um, but one of the main reasons we wanted to bring um, this to your attention this evening as a new business item rather than the consent agenda was potential conflicts with the adjacent property owners. So um, in the past, some of the property owners adjacent to the park have used the park through here to access their rear yards. And while this has never been approved by the city, um, and, and there's no formal agreement. It's just something that they've, they've kind of done. And you can see these logs right here. Originally when they were installed, they were installed straight and some of the property owners have moved them. Park staff would move them back and they would continue to go back and forth with the property owners moving them again. And so last week we sent out a letter to the adjacent property owners letting them know that this project was coming and they would no longer have access uh, through the park to their rear properties with, with the um, required upgrades. One being the larger footprint for the well house that would cut off any circulation on the north side of these pines. Um, secondly, the requirements for the curb. And lastly, the uh, landscape improvements that are gonna happen in this area. And so we're seeking uh, action for the approval of three contracts this evening. The first for earthwork, which would be $158,535. And the earthwork would include the utilities, so sewer water, electrical conduit, um, the excavation and base prep for all the hardscape elements. So the sidewalks, the, um, the parking lot, the curbing and the playground area. The second contract would be for about 46,000 for concrete. 
And again, that would be the sidewalks, curbing, curbing gutter, and the playground edging. And then the last contract uh, for 34,000 for asphalt would cover the necessary patching for utility connections on 21st Avenue, and then the pavement and striping for the actual parking lot itself. And so with that, um, I wanna thank you. And again, we're seeking action for the approval of these three contracts. Robbie, so uh, with the current price of oil, is the price on asphalt uh, more attractive than it has been in the past? Yeah, um, it, it is less than some of the numbers we were seeing last year. Um, yes, but I wouldn't say it's a substantial reduction. I have a question. It surprises me. How, uh, the funding will come out of the general fund, is that correct? Correct. Yes. Go ahead. I have a question. Yeah. Bobby? Yes. So were the neighbors, where they moved those logs, were they parking back there then to access their yards? Um, no, basically there's only a couple. Can you see my screen still? No. 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 Um, can you see it now? Yes. yes. Yeah. So the main problem was with uh, the property here. And so, no, they weren't necessarily parking in the park. They were basically, you can see they have a lot going on back there. And so they were just accessing it through their With through vehicles. The yes, yes. So because that brings up a safety issue too. We don't want vehicles driving in through our parks either. But there, sh there shouldn't be a problem. I, I agree with that. They shouldn't be using that as a driveway. But there shouldn't be any problem with those people whose backyards face the park being able to access the park. No, not pedestrian access, no. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah, they still will have access through any sort of man gate. We're basically okay. saying their, their limited vehicle access will no longer be. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Linda. Um, hey, Robbie, I'm just wondering if that uh, property owner, if those vehicles are licensed or has the code enforcement person went over there? Um, I would not have an answer for that. I, I can't say. I don't know if, if Dave, you have any experience with that. It's okay. I was just wondering. Okay. I think they let me unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, I do not know if they, if they're licensed or not. I know that they have moved off and on over the past quite a few years. This project, as far as trying to block off the usage, um, even hit when Debbie Pyle was our, uh, wow. supervisor. We did stop uh, some of the users who were at the far end from driving through the park, but this is one that was just kind of gone back and forth on. Thanks, Dave. Any other comments? I have a question. Go ahead, Al. Robbie, I just wanted to double check. This isn't going to diminish the size of the soccer field or anything like that, is it? No. So um, the trees that you saw in, in my, uh, screen here those are still going to remain basically the parking lot will go to the edge of the existing um horseshoe pits okay great uh other question uh two hundred and forty thousand dollars for a parking lot i'm not going to argue that but uh parks and rec commission have they weighed in on this i mean is this is this how they want to spend their two hundred and forty thousand bucks I guess I can answer that. And um, it was in our master plan, but no, this was, has not been discussed with uh, the Park and Rec Commission. This has just yeah. been on the capital list. So we're just going on the fact that it was a the part of the master plan versus, I mean, what does Parks and Rec, the commission themselves, do they look at these kind of things? They look at some of them. 
as they come up. Uh, we look at mostly uh, new developments, land acquisitions. Uh, this one is really something that should have been done back when we were building this park, but it never was. We didn't have the funds. We knew that the water um, department was going to be expanding the well, so we've held off on it. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? I'd entertain a motion. I'd move to approve the contracts for Hildy Kellogg parking lot construction. Second. Motion second. Further discussions? Shannon, please take the roll. Malloy? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Borders? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you. Next item up on the agenda is administrative staff reports. Do we have any tonight? We have none tonight, sir. Thank you. Followed by citizen, citizens issues. And these are written comments that have to be submitted uh, no later than 4 p.m. on the date of the meeting. Shannon, do we have any citizen comments? We have one. Okay. This is from W. Scott Howard. Firstly, I would like to say the citizen comments section is missing from the minutes from last meeting. Finally, Disregarding the unconstitutional the unconstitutionality of the governor's current and previous orders, according to the governor's new stay at healthy plan, businesses and governmental agencies may resume operations at physical locations in the state of Idaho. The stay at home order dated March 25th, 2020 and subsequently extended here is hereby rescinded requiring citizen comments via email only and not allowing citizens to be present and participate in city council meetings is unacceptable. I request returning to proper council meetings immediately. Thank you. Mr. Wilson, do we need to comment on that? No. <laughs> Next item up, mayor and council comments, and I have none, uh, council comments. Linda? I just have a question. I had a phone call today from a citizen who lives up on uh, the west side of Spokane Street, and he was actually asking me about the Hildy Kellogg uh, Park where the well is, and he said his water pressure is almost down to nothing up there, and he's wondering um, if this, uh, this construction has anything to do with that. I told him that I would ask maybe Bob Seal might be able to answer, someone might be able to answer that question and I could pass along the answer to him. Thank you. Bob, John, anyone have uh, information for Linda? Information regarding water pressure? Yes. I don't really have much, but we can absolutely look into it. Um, I'm happy to uh, follow up on that. I see Mr. Beach and John, do you have a comment? Yeah. I uh, kind of echoing what Bob said, I don't specifically have information. That is a, we're working next door, so there's obviously the potential for something to be going on. But uh, if there's next to zero water pressure, that is not what should be happening. Customers should all still be in water service. So uh, if there's a way to have that person contact the water department, they could make an in-person visit. Or if, if contact information can get passed along to me, I can make that connection as well. Okay, thank you, John, I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I wanna go back, I said I had no comments, but I just wanted to let uh, council know that I continue to reach out to the governor's office. Uh, they've been very responsive. Uh, I've called down, I know Mr. Malloy and I have shared a letter um, trying to get businesses open as soon as we can. And uh, we will continue, I will continue to reach out to the governor's office. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna to touch base with them again tomorrow. Uh, but it's our goal to get businesses open as soon as we can. So that's uh, that's the goal, that's our effort. And of course we are limited to uh, what the governor allows. Uh, his law and his orders supersede anything the city council can do. But uh, I do wanna let you know that I remain in contact and trying to get some of these things addressed. Carrie. Similarly, I have written a letter to the governor's office uh, about the businesses and like a month ago, maybe three and a half weeks ago. 
And I've also submitted questions for our Thursday um, conference call with the governor um, on that topic, which have yet to be asked. And I've not received a response from the governor's uh -huh. office either. Um, but yeah, so uh, it's, I know he's busy, but it is a little frustrating because I know that you and I and Joe aren't the only people that have had communication and it's been slow in uh, getting any kind of responses. So, so more power to you, carry on. I will keep reaching out. Tonight, we do need an executive session and wait a minute, let me get back to my agenda. Yes, we do. And so what we're going to have to do is after the motion is made and approved, we will sign off of this meeting, sign into a new Zoom meeting for executive session and uh, take up from there. So is there a motion to come forward? I would move to enter into executive session pursuant to Idaho code 74-2061F to communicate with legal counsel for the public agency to discuss the legal ramifications of and legal options for pending litigation or controversies not yet being litigated, but intimately likely to be litigated that we will make no decisions in that session and that it will last no more than 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Wolf. Borders. Aye. Wilhelm. Aye. Thorson. Aye. Anthony. Aye. Malloy. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. We will enter into executive session. So I believe we leave the meeting and sign into a new one. So we'll see yep. you there. Yep. Mr. Mayor, if I yes. might. Yes. Just in case there's any public still in this meeting, I, it's my understanding this meeting will remain open so they can stay here so that when we sign back in, they won't have to go through the process again. So okay. they're free to remain here while you're in executive session. And then when you come back, they'll be in your meeting again. Okay. Thank you, John.
this seat is ready. That took a long time. We are ready in any time you are. Jay, we're just going to wait a few more minutes and see if we get uh, Councillors Thorson and Anthony back online. Maybe. Ward, are we okay to go? We are, we have a quorum. Move Ward, to adjourn. Motion, come forward. Move to adjourn. Second. Motion second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.